Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Andrea Sincata? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. In 1988, 42-year-old Andrea Sincata met a 26-year-old man named James Christopher Johnson, who went by the name Chris. Andrea was a librarian. She had a 15-year-old son named Kevin. Chris worked at a Home Depot store. In July 1991, Chris and Andrea became engaged and moved into an apartment in Arlington, Virginia. The couple started building a house on a river a few hours away. The house was also in Virginia. They were constructing it themselves. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On August 21, 1998, Chris went to work at Home Depot as usual. Andrea had the day off. Throughout Chris's workday, he called Andrea a few times and left messages on the answering machine at the apartment. He arrived home at about 6 p.m. He noticed Andrea was not there, but he wasn't initially worried because she had told him that she might be helping a friend that day. Chris would later say that he started becoming concerned after 10 p.m. He made calls looking for Andrea. For example, he called a friend of hers, her son Kevin, and a few hospitals. Chris went to sleep at about 11.30 p.m. At 1.30 a.m., now on August 22, he woke up and noticed that a closet door in the bedroom was closed when normally it was left open. He investigated and found Andrea's body in the closet. She was cold to the touch. Chris called 911. The police arrived and started their investigation. They found that Andrea had been dead for several hours. She had been strangled. They found no signs of forced entry into the apartment and no indication there was a struggle. Chris told the police that coins, a gym bag, and two purses were missing from the apartment. Andrea's Honda Civic was also missing. In the three days following Andrea's murder, the police interviewed Chris for several hours. After the first day of interviewing, Chris found Andrea's Honda Civic when he was out driving. This only made the police more suspicious and prompted additional interviews. Chris repeatedly denied any involvement in Andrea's murder. During an interview on August 24, the police repeatedly lied to Chris, insisting that Andrea was alive when he came home and that Chris's fingerprints were on her body. By this point, Chris was extremely tired. He had been interviewed for about 25 hours since discovering Andrea's body. Chris described what could have happened almost as if he was dreaming. He said he imagined he was holding Andrea, he hit her, she fell, and she wasn't breathing. He must have put her in the closet after that. Chris wrote a three-page statement, which essentially repeated his verbal statements. The police knew that Chris's dream vision did not match the evidence. For example, Andrea was strangled. She did not die from being struck. There was nothing that the police could do with Chris's confession. Chris told the police about another potential suspect, a man who Andrea had interacted with four weeks before she died. The man was performing work at the apartment complex where Andrea lived. Andrea had given the man an old computer that she did not want anymore. The computer had been in the same bedroom closet where Andrea's body was found. The police were able to identify the man as Bobby Joe Leonard. The police talked to Bobby and decided that he could not be involved. This decision was odd considering that Bobby had previous convictions for violent crimes. The police actually interviewed him in a Philadelphia jail where he was facing assault charges that would later be dropped. With Chris's confession being useless and Bobby being ruled out as a potential suspect, nothing moved forward in the investigation. In 1999, Bobby Joe Leonard tried to kill a 13-year-old girl in Fairfax County, Virginia. He choked her and put her in a closet. When he was interviewed by the police, he told them he was surprised that his victim survived. He was convicted in connection with this attack and, in 2000, was sentenced to life in prison. The fact that the closet was involved in his crime and in Andrea's murder placed more suspicion on Bobby Joe Leonard, but the police still did not have enough evidence to charge anyone. The case of Andrea's murder remained inactive until 2018, 
When Bobby Joe Leonard told investigators he found religion and now had a change of heart. He confessed to Andrea's murder, but told investigators he had been hired by a mysterious man to kill her. Here was the story that Bobby supplied to the police. He took possession of the unwanted computer from Andrea. She called him to make sure the computer was working and handed the phone to Chris to continue talking about the computer because Chris knew more about it. Bobby didn't think too much about Andrea or Chris again, but then he received a call from a man a few weeks later. Bobby claimed that the caller ID displayed Andrea's number, and the man sounded a lot like Andrea's boyfriend. The man had an offer for Bobby. He wanted Andrea Sincata to be murdered and would pay Bobby $5,000 to do it. The man said it was a rush job. It had to be done the next day when Andrea was home. The man also told Bobby other information and gave him instructions. For example, the man supplied Bobby Andrea's schedule, told him to wear gloves, cover his face, and not to use a gun because that would be too loud. The man informed Bobby that the $5,000 would be left in the closet where Bobby had originally picked up the computer. Bobby showed up at Andrea's apartment and Andrea offered him a root beer. He strangled Andrea and then searched for the $5,000 in the closet, but it wasn't there. Bobby did not attempt to pursue this man who hired him. He just let the entire matter go. So he didn't try to get his $5,000. In November of 2021, Chris and Bobby were both charged in connection with Andrea's murder. Bobby quickly pleaded guilty and was later given another life sentence, but Chris maintained his innocence. Chris went on trial for murder for hire. In October 2022, the case went to the jury. They only needed one hour to find Chris Johnson not guilty. Chris is planning on filing a civil suit. Now moving to my analysis. The case of Andrea Sincata is hotly debated. In March of 2023, it was covered on the TV show 2020. Kevin Sincata, Andrea's son, has been vocal about his belief that Chris was actually responsible for the murder, despite the acquittal. There is a website called Justice for Andrea that criticizes the narrative presented by 2020. The website doesn't contain information about who wrote the content for the site, at least not that I could find. However, I think it's not hard to figure out who could be responsible. I read through the arguments that were made on the website, but almost all the items could be classified as minutiae. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Chris Johnson was responsible for Andrea's death, starting with the inculpatory factors. There is no doubt that Bobby Joe Leonard murdered Andrea and, as part of his confession, implicated Chris Johnson. The fact that Chris was in the apartment for seven and a half hours before reporting that he found Andrea's body could be interpreted as him stalling, like he was using that time to clean up the crime scene. Andrea's son, Kevin, said that Chris lied about vacuuming. Initially, Chris said that he didn't vacuum, but later allegedly admitted that he did. Chris appeared to offer some type of strange dream vision quasi-confession after being berated and lied to by the police for several hours. It was inconsistent with the murder scene. However, innocent people usually don't confess either in or out of a dream state. Chris found Andrea's car not long after being interviewed by the police for the first time. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Bobby Joe Leonard was not a credible witness, mostly because of the murder part. He was a violent career criminal who had a particular penchant for strangling people. Bobby Joe Leonard frequently lied. For example, after meeting with investigators in 2018, he called his girlfriend and said that the governor was going to pardon him for all his crimes. This, of course, was not true. The governor was not even involved in the negotiations with Bobby Joe Leonard. I guess that Bobby was trying to convince his girlfriend to stay with him, to make it seem as though there was some hope that he would be released someday. But unless she was interested in being strangled, a pardon for Bobby would not be good news for her. There is a debate about whether Bobby actually gained anything from implicating Chris, but even if he didn't, he may have thought that dragging Chris into the case was his only chance of improving his situation in prison. Right before Bobby was supposed to testify against Chris, there was some type of drama and his testimony was delayed. He apparently wanted some type of concession related to 
a potential prison transfer. Regardless of whether or not he received that concession, this last-minute theater does not help his already tarnished reputation. I think the word tarnished is actually a bit kind. Bobby Joe's reputation was already destroyed by this point. Bobby claimed that he saw Andrea's phone number on his caller ID when the mysterious man called him about killing Andrea. Bobby's ex-wife said that they did not have caller ID. Bobby said that Andrea did not resist when he attacked her, but there were bruises on her consistent with resisting an attack. Chris did not benefit financially from Andrea's death. His name was the only one on the deed to the house on the river. There was actually no motive at all for Chris to kill Andrea. Chris Johnson never met Bobby Joe Leonard in person, so the state would have people believe that Chris briefly spoke on the phone to this man who took Andrea's computer and thought to himself, in addition to picking up old computers, I wonder if this guy would also murder someone for money. It doesn't make any sense that Chris would have hired Bobby. As far as Chris's dream vision confession, Chris has a pretty good explanation for why he did this. He thought the police always told the truth. He believed they were honest, when in fact they are not. The police deceived him in such a way where he came to believe that Andrea must have been alive when he was in the apartment. He tried to offer them some scenario to explain it, despite not having any memory of killing anyone. On the day Andrea was murdered, she missed lunch with a friend. This makes it seem like she was already dead at that point. Chris was at work at this time. During the trial, the state tried to argue that Chris falsely confessed to take the heat off Bobby. The state created two problems for themselves by doing this. One, they admitted that Chris's confession was invalid. And two, why would Chris confess that he was the killer in order to protect a guy that he allegedly hired to commit the murder? What point does that serve? Isn't the idea behind lying to escape responsibility? What good would it be for Chris to protect Bobby if Chris went to prison anyway? So Chris would be locked away for life and thinking to himself, things could be worse, at least they didn't get my conspirator. Most people find that a non-confession course of action is more conducive to circumventing incarceration. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that Chris Johnson was involved in Andrea's murder? No. I do not believe that Chris was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and I don't believe that he was guilty in reality. I think he was actually innocent. Chris is the victim of police officers who were not interested in finding the truth. They berated somebody who was innocent, and this eventually led to him being tried for murder. The police and the prosecutors involved in this case should be embarrassed at their behavior. They tried to falsely convict an innocent man, and they gave Andrea's family members hope that Chris was guilty. Bobby Joe Leonard was the killer. He's in prison for life. There is no more to the story. The only other villains in this case work for the state. Moving to the last question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Andrea Sincata had an old computer that she wanted to throw away. She saw Bobby working at her apartment complex and thought that maybe he would take it because the name of the company he was working for had the word trash in it. She saw the company name on his truck. Andrea approached him. He said that he did not work for a trash company, but he would take the computer for himself. Andrea invited Bobby into her apartment, at which time he removed the computer from her closet. This encounter gave Bobby an idea about how he could commit homicide. He realized that he could probably gain access to Andrea's apartment again without using force. He could simply show up and say that he was there about the computer. This is exactly what he did. Bobby returned to Andrea's apartment on August 21, murdered her, and put her body in the bedroom closet. The next year, Bobby committed another violent crime and was sentenced to life in prison. He knew that he would never be released, but he hoped that he could get transferred to a better prison someday. He knew that he needed some type of leverage, something he could offer the state, like information about an unsolved crime. He knew that he killed Andrea, but if he confessed to that murder, his situation would not improve. Bobby came up with this idea of confessing and implicating Chris Johnson. He fabricated a story about a mysterious man hiring him for $5,000, and the police were gullible enough to believe it.
the state had so much confidence in that dream vision confession, they didn't worry about logic, morality, or common sense. They pushed forward with a bad case, and it only took the jury one hour to expose the state's poor decision. Now moving to my final thoughts. Chris Johnson's situation could have been avoided simply by not talking to the police. He believed that the police were the good guys, but to someone in Chris Johnson's position, this is not true. The criminal justice system is adversarial. A citizen should never talk to the police. Chris believed that the police always tell the truth, but in reality, they routinely deceive people as part of their job. Fortunately, in this case, the jury was wise enough to appreciate the reckless behavior of the state. Those are my thoughts in the case of Andreas and Kata. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.